As I said, we've been going through John chapter 17, verse by verse, or section by section. Last week I covered verses 16 to 19 and spoke at length on sanctification as life's number one priority. But during the week, as I was considering moving on, I was persuaded that we needed to have a further look, and specifically at verse 17. Since sanctification is so important, remember Hebrews chapter 12, pursue peace with all men and holiness. No man shall see the Lord. It's vitally important. Since it's so important, we need to take a few minutes to consider the means that God uses to sanctify us. And that is first and foremost, the word of God. And that's why as Christians, we treasure it. That's why we love what it says, sometimes feel its pinch, but at other times are encouraged by its very positive truths, which are given to us through it. And so we turn to verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. Just a few lines on a piece of paper and very easy to pass over, but really important to take time to reflect on and to consider because God has appointed his word, preserved it over all these centuries for the purpose, not simply of expanding your knowledge, but of transforming your life. Sanctify them by your truth. What is your truth, Lord? Your word is truth. And so the Bible takes this high place in our lives. God uses it to change people. And that's how we become a Christian. Once we weren't, once we weren't, and now we are. An illustration that came to mind was the, the conversion of the man that's often called St. Augustine. I know it was a long time ago, but it's really quite a remarkable conversion. He came from a godly home. His mother prayed for him incessantly. He was born in North Africa and moved to Rome, where we were told he lived a thoroughly wicked life. But his mother prayed for him. He was apparently in a garden behind the house one day when he heard a voice saying, take up and read, take up and read. It was a child on a swing in the garden next door going back and forward. Take up and read, take up and read. And there was a Bible to hand. And so Augustine picked up the Bible and read Romans 13 verse 14. I doubt whether any of you will know exactly what it says, but it is the word of God. And this is what it says. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. The Lord used that to bring Augustine to Christ and it changed his life. As I said, he was living a thoroughly wicked life. And just after this, he was walking when he, he was being followed by the lady he had lived with. And she shouted to him, Augustine. Augustine, it is I. And so he took one look at her apparently and he shuddered and replied to her with these very simple but beautiful words. It is not I. It is not I. You see, God's word had changed this man completely. And that is a beautiful thing to remember. And I hope everybody here can testify to a time, whether dramatic like Augustine or very quiet like Lydia, where, where your whole life was turned around. But here's the good news. God has left you here to show the world the wonders of his love and mercy. Earlier on in this chapter, the Lord Jesus in verse 15 says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. Isn't that incredible? I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Why does he want us left in the world? So that the world can see and you can experience the power of God's word changing you day after day into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, it will never be complete in time. Because we're told in First John, aren't we, that it's when we see him that we like him. But we're a work in progress. How is that progress to be measured and experienced? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. And with that verse, I want to take three subheadings. First of all, it is revealed. Secondly, it is truth. And thirdly, it is life changing. God's word is a miracle in itself. We've been singing hymns which all refer to the wonder of God's word and the marvelous way that it does and can and should affect our life. Why is it so significant? Because we have a God who speaks. We have a God who has spoken. I have a friend who's a deist. Him and I talk often. And he, he does not deny the existence of God, but completely denies any idea that this God communicates with mankind other than in creation and the world around us. But the testimony of the Bible is God speaks. In the beginning, God spoke, didn't he not? And he commanded things to come into existence. The power of his word. And you and I need to recognize that what we have in our Bibles is not some simply the uh, philosophical ramblings of some uh, godly men and women, but rather a revelation that God has made, provided, and preserves. We are believers. What do we believe? Not simply that God exists like my friend, but we believe that God speaks, that God has spoken, and that through what he says, we find out that he is holy, we find out that we are sinners, we find out about his great love for sinners, we find out that he sent his son, we find out that if we will believe in his son, then our sins are forgiven. Now think about all that. You would know nothing at all about that unless God had provided his word. You'd be left in the dreamland of Buddhism or Hinduism with their fantastical images and ideas about reincarnation. Instead, we have a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. And when you became a Christian, that light did not stop shining. There's a little verse in Proverbs, isn't there, where it, where it talks about that, that light shining brighter and brighter as we go along our path. And so the word of God is to be received in this unique and special sense. Now, he not only gives us the word, and as I was preparing, I, I was conscious of my danger of sort of elevating the Bible to become like an idol. He also sent his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who uses the word to bring about that likeness of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one that is spoken of in Hebrews when we are told that the word of God is sharp and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, isn't it? The word of God is made Alive by the Holy Spirit. Now this is the testimony all the way through the Bible. This is where Christians go to find out who they are, what life's about, how to be holy. But as I have said already, holiness is our single essential life purpose. Our priority, because without holiness, no man, you see, no exceptions, no man or woman or boy or girl will see the Lord. We are made holy through faith in Christ, therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God. That word justified is a form of the Greek word for holiness. But then we have this 
continual life experience of being transformed by our interaction with the word. And for that reason, then, the, the Bible speaks very clearly about the importance of the word of God. One example, and there are many, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Paul writes to his young trainee, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. Notice that, learned, believed. Knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good word. Do you see the, the two levels? It makes you wise for salvation, but then it changes you so that you are ready to live for and to serve God in the world. So you have here in the 66 books of the Bible the things that God has deemed vitally important for mankind to hear. Do you, do you never read your Bible and ask the question, why didn't God explain this part and that part? They want to know how this happened. We were preaching on the resurrection a couple of weeks ago, and somebody asked me afterwards about the clothing lying in the tomb. And it's really frustrating because you can come up with ideas, but you don't have a real explanation of what happened there. Did Jesus come out through the clothing? Did he unwind it and put it to the side? Did an angel help? You don't get all these answers because the Bible is not an exhaustive record of history. It is, in fact, a book written so that you might be, what was the words? You may be wise for salvation. And down through the Bible, you'll find many dead ends because your imagination or your thinking wants to go there. But they're not there because they're not necessary for your salvation. And they're not necessary for your sanctification. 66 books, 40 authors written over a period of, what, 2,000 years, and yet one consistent narrative. There is a God in heaven. He is righteous and holy. Men and women have rebelled, but he didn't abandon them because he is also the God of love. And he, from the beginning, appointed a way of redemption. Where do I find out? In his book. Even as Adam and Eve has sinned and he speaks to Eve, Adam and the serpent in order. Notice he speaks. And even there he declares that Christ is coming. There's one coming whom the serpent, serpent will bruise his head. Yes, but bruise his heel, sorry. The, 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 the one who comes will crush his head. And that golden thread can be found all the way through the Old Testament and it realized in the one who is born of a woman in due time under the law that he might deliver us from the law. But he didn't just come to clean up our past. He comes to clear up our future as well. God reveals himself and that's what you have in this book. In every page, you should be asking the question, what is there to learn about God here? What is there to see about Christ here? What is there to see about my own sinful nature here? And so this book then becomes something far more significant than just a book, than just another one to take up space on the shelf the Bible is a book to be read, to be experienced, and to behold God in his great love and mercy. When Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, he writes, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns 
and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. Don't you just want to underline that? Prophecy never came by the will of man. It's not that some clever person sat in the corner and said om and tried to work out what life was about. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. If I were preaching on that verse, I'd point to that word moved. And, and it, it relates to the early times it was written in when ships were powered by sails. And the word moved is the word they would use to describe the wind filling the sail and moving it along. That's how God works. That's how you have this book in your hand. That's why it's important to recognize its unique and special significance for our life. It's not something you have to read. It's something that you want to read. And that surely is a mark of the new heart that the Holy Spirit gives us. That there is a, a hunger to know about God. A hunger to know who he is, what he's like, and how that should affect me. And it's in these pages that you find it. I've been a Christian for a long time, but I still find this book talks to me. Things I've read many, many times, and you're reading it in different circumstances, and it speaks to you. I don't need voices in my head. Because I have the voice of God in my hand. And therefore, you and I need to make it the, 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 the focus of our life. Everything God wants you to know about him is here. If he should speak again today, he would never say anything other than that which is in this book. So think long and hard and ask yourself whether the Bible is that lamp for your feet and light for your path, which God intends it to be. Are you taking time to read it? You can go at different speeds. You can use different methods. We're swamped with books to help us, etc., over my long lifetime, I've done various things. You read a chapter a day. You try to get through the Bible in a year. There's all these different techniques. But it's not so that you can tick off, done it. It's so that you can hear God speaking. At the present time, I read it a paragraph at a time. And that's enough for me. Because I want to hear God speak. It's being given to me. And to the unbeliever, we need to point out that you need to hear what this book says. Last week, I used an illustration and it stuck with me. I make no apology for repeating it. I remember the days when we only had black and white television. Most of you can, but some will. I remember when we didn't even have a television in the house. We went to a neighbor's to watch it. But then color TV came back. And once you got color TV, there was no going back. You might have an old black and white set in a bedroom somewhere, but that's been long gone. Because you know the color. And that, for me, is a, a, a useful illustration of where the unbeliever is. You see, you're reading the Bible in black and white. Please don't say you've got a red letter edition. You know what I mean. You're reading the Bible in black and white. And what you need is for God's engineer, the Holy Spirit, to make it technical. And it should be your prayer and desire to be dissatisfied. I remember when we first got a color television, you could go to work and tell your buddies, we've got a color television. There's a bit of bragging and boasting. But if you can apply that to the unbeliever, you see, we've got this this. Help from God through his word, which is available to you if you will simply come and believe. Take him at his word. Trust him and move forward. John 
tells us here that Jesus' prayer went on. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. I want to focus on sanctify them by your truth. Because this is an issue for the modern generation. And what I need to do is to emphasize what Jesus has emphasized. The Bible is not simply true. It is truth. The Bible is not simply true. It is truth. If you could read the original language, you would see that the word truth has, is it a demonst- has, the, has, a, has the word the in front of it. I'm not embarrass myself by trying to remember the technical names as the word truth. The word truth has the word the in front of it. So it's not a truth on the same plane as anybody else's claim for truth. It is the truth. And in that sense, it stands as an absolute authority for all mankind, whether it's a believer or not. And it is, in fact, the standard by which all other truth claims are tested. Now, this is a generation where everybody wants to say, you've got your truth and I've got my truth. And what happens at the end of the day is that nobody knows whatever is true because it's down to a subjective feeling. We're not left in that mess. The Bible is truth that requires our obedience. Because as our creator, in the same way that he gave a command to Adam and Eve not to eat off, This creator has continued to speak and to explain to us that there are two ways to live in the world. One, in fellowship with him, your will be done in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven, or in rebellion to him. And really, that's the definition of sin, is it not? There's a big word used to describe sin sometimes in the Bible, and it's called transgression. It simply means to cross the line. And so there is a line where you have God's truth and you have everybody else's vain imaginations. And therefore, Jesus makes this affirmation in the passage. Earlier on, he says, I've given them your word. Earlier on, he says, they have believed your word. And if you've believed his word, you need to recognize It's not only there for your personal conversion, it's there for your great comfort and change and to change your life and make you develop. And so you use the word of God as the final authority in everything that relates to God. There's a lovely verse in the Old Testament which has helped me for years. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. To the law and the testimony... If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Notice that. If they do not speak according to this word, that's the authority. They're in the dark. They're captive to sin. The Lord Jesus says in John chapter 8, To the Jews who believed in him, it says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And that's surely the glory that we have as Christians. We have been made free. And the word of God then becomes a a joy and a delight to us. When I prepared the hymns, I ended up with three hymns from the book of Psalms. I choose them because of content rather than looking to see where they come from. Because the psalmist knew the value of God's word, Psalm 19, but then especially Psalm 119. The longest chapter in the Bible, isn't it? And what's it all about? God's word, God's truth, God's glorious truth given by God so that we might know who we are and who he is and how to live in his world. We have our own homes, most of us, I'm assuming. 
And when somebody comes into our home, they want to fit in with how we do things, don't they? Or at least that's the idea. And if you go into somebody else's home, you want to not offend and make sure you function as they try to function. The analogy expands exponentially. This is God's world. And he has set it up with certain standards and practices. They're called the truth. And if you understand it's God's world, you want to live in his world to please him. So that when you meet him, you'll get a welcome. The Bible is God's truth. It's God's truth for you and for me. Remember Jesus' words, I am the way. You know the next one, don't you? The truth and the life. Not a truth. He's not on the same level as Muhammad or Buddha or whoever else you want to throw in there, Confucius and I'm showing the limits of my knowledge of other religions. He's not there just as another philosopher. He has come as God incarnate in the flesh. Intriguingly, at the beginning of John's gospel, called the Word. The Word who became flesh. The Word who dwelt amongst us. So when we come to, to read God's book, we, we not only hear what God has said we not only understand it's the truth we see Jesus and that's how we proclaim God's word to the world Benjamin Warfield wrote, wrote a master thesis on the whole inspiration and revelation of God's word one very brief paragraph the scriptures are declared to be the word of God in such a sense that God is their author and they, because immediately inspired by God, are of infallible truth and divine authority and are to be believed to be true by the Christian man in whatsoever is revealed in them. For the authority of God himself speaks therein. This is where the Christian church finds her anchor and her strength. We're not just following the latest religious fad. We're not just caught up with our favorite preacher or teacher or author. We're caught up with the word of God. We take everything back to the word of God. You remember that passage in Acts 17? I always chuckle when I read it, where the people in Berea are considered to be more noble than the other Christians. Why? Because they check up on the apostle Paul. And if he could be happy to be checked up on, so should any preacher. Our authority is the word of God. The last verse in Psalm 119, number uh, verse 160. The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. The entirety of your word. Genesis to Revelation. is truth to be heard to be trusted for life and in life a message that mankind isn't hearing and needs to hear and 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 if it's fair to say i think even as christians we're no longer hearing it as we once did people simply go to places of worship for a nice experience and then they leave, they leave disappointed because they've not had some kind of buzz. Well, when they do that, they've come for the wrong reason. I come to church to worship God and to listen to him. And as I go out the door, I want to be able to say, I heard God say. There was something in that preacher's words which really penetrated. God used it. An old American preacher that I, I, I knew of and liked his writings. Yes, one of my spiritual heroes used to say, if the only voice you hear here today is my voice, you will leave here as miserable as you came in. You need to hear from God. I hope you're hearing 
from God, hearing about God's incredible intervention to save men and women. Is there in any other religion anything like who Jesus is and what Jesus did? The Lord of glory through whom all things were made so that there's nothing that was made except through him. You find that at the beginning of John's gospel. It's not just my opinion. He came here, walked the dirt of this planet, endured the horrors of human rebellion, so that the very people who one week were, were singing Hosanna, the next week said, crucify him. And he went willingly to that cross so that you might know the holiness of God and the love of God. And you might be brought to your knees to believe in him. Have you got that kind of an interest in God's truth? Thank God if you have. Too many Christians' Bibles gather dust. How often do you hear people memorizing the Bible now? When I was a young Christian, it was a normal thing to do. And these become milestones or markers through God's word. If you were to explain the Bible to an unbeliever, where would you start? These are important questions. And when you understand you have God's truth, then you are equipped to speak to a world that James Montgomery Boyce says is living in an illusion. They don't think, do they? They live for the moment. And then death knocks on the door and says, time to meet God. They're not prepared. They're not ready. If you've heard and learned the truth through Jesus Christ, you have what they need to hear. And down in their hearts are actually desiring to hear. What a tragedy to know that God's word exists. The truth is here. And to end up standing before God saying, you know, I had a Bible at home, but never read it. Started in Genesis, got as far as Leviticus, and then thought, what's all this about? Missing the very heart of the message of substitutionary atonement, of free grace in Jesus Christ, and everlasting life for whosoever will believe. Who not that fabulous? While life goes on, God is saying to mankind, repent, believe. And no matter how much of a horrible person you've been or how imaginarily good you've been, he will receive you. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Isn't that the glory of the gospel? And then to think that this God has actually left us here for that purpose. 1 Timothy 1.16, I can't quote it, but I, I, I encourage you to read it. Because in that passage, Paul explains why he's been left alive on the planet. That other people might see Christ in him and come to Christ himself. You may stumble in speaking to people, but listen, dear friend, you are speaking. Paul says, we are a book read and known by all men. And as you understand the truth, you will know the power of it changing you. That's where I want to go to for my last section. Because Jesus does pray, sanctify them. And just in case... Well, most of you weren't here last week. Just in case you missed last week. This is God's purpose for your life. What's life about? Why am I here? What happens to me as I go through life? Why does so much trouble bump into me? Well, there's a whole series of questions that are answered by this one word. That you might be sanctified. That you might be made holy. That you might... Understand the power of God and the way that the Holy Spirit 
intervenes to change us by the truth. Jesus' words to Nicodemus are where it starts. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I pray you've heard that and believed it. And you've come into God's kingdom because you've been born again. But then to realize that this book is given so that it will continue to change you. John 16 and verse 8, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Please, not just the world out there, the world in here. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 13. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you, believers. Work out your own salvation, says Paul to the Philippians, with fear and trembling, and I'm glad he didn't stop there. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. The word of God is like a mirror, says Paul to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know what happens when you see the mirror? We have one in the hall, and when you walk past it, there's an automatic, is my hair straight? Have I got dirt on my chin? A mirror has that power, doesn't it? You look into it and you automatically make adjustments. God's word is a mirror. So that you see yourself as God sees you. And then you go to Christ for cleansing and want to be like him. Paul writes to the Ephesians about the church as the bride of Christ. And says in verse 26 that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. You probably washed your face this morning. I hope you did. Why? Get the dust out your eye and get you ready for the day. The word of God is to have that kind of an effect on us. Removing, exposing the muck of life. And then moving us onward. And for that reason, when you see these things like the verse we're looking at, you begin to realize how absolutely precious God's word is to you. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. Your words became a joy and the delight of my heart. Oh, how I long to be able to say that every morning as I open his book. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. There was an interesting article this week, and I'm almost finished. In I don't know if you're aware of the Evangelical Times, but they've begun to send out a weekly sort of blog post. And in that blog post, there's an article by Stuart Olliott, and I read it through and I thought, wow, that's just what I need for my sermon on Sunday. Because when you're listening to material like this, one of the dangers is, is you imagine that there's a tick list that you have to tick off so that you get God's approval. And all it very cleverly interacts with the imaginary questioner about this. And his desire for what he called mountaintop experiences, you know, where you're really close to God. And Elliot was a great help as I read that. <laughs> he says, the most frequent place to meet God with any significance is not the mountaintop. It's in the valley. And we spend most of our lives in the valleys. You might get to a mountaintop when you're on holiday. And it's in the valleys that God meets us and then he writes and I'm reading word for word you're never going to be a success so get that out of your head even after many years as a Christian the apostle Paul said I am present tense the chief of sinners 
Own up to being a sinner. Admit it in every prayer. You will find that the Savior will never turn you away. Every day, talk to him in detail about your mess. And to your delight and surprise, you will find not only his pardon, but that little by little he is unmessing you. The fact is that the scribe and Pharisees got this one right. This man receives sinners and eats with them. I encourage you to go and have a look at their blog post. I'm not on commission in any sense. But to stop and escape this idea where sanctification is something that I need to tick off on my list of, what is it they call it? Bucket list of Christianity. Sanctification is a life-changing, lifelong work where God sometimes has to bring us back the things we learned previously because we've stopped practicing them. But he makes that full promise that when we're in Christ, there is no condemnation. Jesus has paid it all. All to him I owe. And now by the power of his grace, I am being transformed. Are you being transformed? You can tell. Is Jesus Christ more precious to you today than he was yesterday? Are you more excited about the fact that God loves you today than you were last Sunday? I came across this about John Newton when he was getting on. It said in the book, well past retirement age. I have to be careful that I might apply somewhere else here. But what he used to do was have an assistant stand with him in the pulpit. Because he, he couldn't see his eyesight was failing. And apparently one Sunday while he was delivering his message, he repeated the sentence, Jesus Christ is precious. His helper apparently whispered to him, but you've already said that twice. And apparently Newton turned to his helper and said loudly, yes, I've said it twice and I'm going to say it again. Jesus Christ is precious. Altogether lovely. The fairest of ten thousands to my soul. Where do I get these ideas? Oh, in this book. And that through this book, we find the liberty and freedom of being children of God. And we grow and develop to become like our Heavenly Father. How is it time? Time for me to finish. One final finish. One final word to finish with. Remember, God's word sanctifies. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Way back in the, I think it would be 1700s, you had the famous story of the mutiny on the bounty, where they took over the ship and they sailed to what was the Pitcairn Islands, a tiny island in the South Pacific. It says here about two miles long and a mile wide. Tiny. After 10 years, due to drink and fighting, only one man was left alive, John Adams. 11 women and 23 children made up the rest of the island's population, and they were locked in. And about this time, we're told, Adams came across the Bounty's Bible in the bottom of an old chest. And he began to read it. And the power of that gospel changed his life radically so that when explorers next came to the island, every individual on the island was a believer. No outside input, just God's word. Just God's word. I pray that you will have a fresh understanding of the wonder of the book that's in your hands or on your lap or on your phone or iPad. And you won't just say, I've done my reading. I hope you do your reading. But that's not your goal. You'll be able to say, Jesus Christ is precious. Amen.
737. I chose this because surely once you understand God's word, it's precious. You want it to affect your life. And of course, it's a paraphrase of Psalm 119. Oh, that the Lord would guide my ways to keep his statutes still. Oh, that my God would grant me grace to know and do his will. 737. thank you for ears to hear your word. We thank you for a brain to process it. But we long, Lord, for the power of it in our lives, changing us day by day into the image of him who is altogether lovely. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.